So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited that you're here. Um, I'm Mickey Reggio. I'm an analyst and project coordinator at Parsons TKO. And today we'll be talking about our content impact study um, that my colleague Chelsea Louie is here to help us with. Uh, Chelsea, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Chelsea. I'm really happy to be sharing a bit about the content study. Um, I worked on the study with Mickey and another one of our colleagues, Stefan Bird Kruger, last year. Um, so very happy to be sharing this. Uh, additionally, I'm also a communications officer with Activism Always, I'm a student-founded uh, startup that's really working to uplift uh, mission-driven organizations uh, using social listening technology, doing these type of studies, and looking into the space more. Thanks so much, Chelsea. And for those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. We're Parsons TKO, a nonprofit consulting agency that works with nonprofits and other mission-driven organizations to improve their engagement via things like marketing tech, data strategy, and business processes. All right. And with that, let's go ahead and jump in. So just as a brief agenda today, we're gonna to be talking about the content study, what we found from talking to so many different people in the mission-driven sector. Chelsea's gonna walk us through that and some of our main findings and takeaways. Um, and then she'll pass it back to me and we'll talk about some practical applications and what this means for you and your role at your organization. So before we get rolling, uh, we're going to do a little poll. So thanks for everyone who participated in the chat telling us where you're calling in from. We have a super diverse audience, which is super great from all around the US. And so I just launched our poll so you should see it. And so we just are asking about your role in your department, and then we'll share the results uh, when we're done. Give it a few more seconds. All right, I'll go ahead and end the poll. Thank you for everyone who participated and you should all be able to see the results. And so we have a large variety, which is also really cool. Looks like we mostly have partners, directors and mid-level managers, no interns, but that's okay. Um, and from the department, we have an overwhelmingly majority for communications, which makes a lot of sense, um, but also glad to see some analytics folks, uh, some C-suite and other. All right, so thanks for participating in our first poll. I'm going to pass it back to Chelsea to get us started. All right, I guess we'll get right to it. Um, really diving into what you're all here for to learn a bit more about the content impact study that we've worked on. Um, so really our exploration into, the con into content impact is how I would best describe it. Um, we were really interested in these sort of like three main points that I have detailed here. This is really what got us interested in the first place. Um, we really wanted to know how content was defined by professionals in the mission-driven space, the relevance of data specifically in mission-driven work, and then the role of data in content development. So these three ideas really summarize, we just want to understand better the value and direction of data in the mission-driven space. And we found that content is something that mission-driven orgs are always producing. Um, and later in these slides, we'll see all the different ways uh, content is being produced and all the different ways content is being described. So in those questions and in actually starting our study, we wanted to have some type of theory, some type of baseline to start our work with. And that's where the five content stages come in. Um, for most of you uh, who are working in communications, these stages are probably familiar, uh, even if you haven't seen it laid out specifically like this. I'm sure you've at least heard uh, of something similar, seen something similar, or work in one of these five stages yourself, or maybe all of them. Um, so this was really our baseline. Um, this is the baseline for most people working in comms. You usually start by strategizing. You create something, you promote it, you measure it, and then you refine that work, and you do it over and over again 
um, to create the content that best represents your organization, best represents the mission that you're working towards. Um, however, we wanted to push that a bit further. Uh, and through the study, we really asked people how they define different stages, where they saw data working in these different stages, and how they wanted to improve processes within the stages. So with our next slide, uh, I can talk a bit more about what we actually did. So we call this a content study, our exploration into content impact. Um, but really what we did was set up a number of uh, intimate interviews. This began in June of 2021, and it led through sort of mid-fall uh, 2021, uh, where we conducted 16 interviews on the topic of content impact. And we have a very uh, just broad breakdown to give you an idea. Um, but it looks a bit like our audience here today, actually. Um, we talked to some technology professionals. So these were people that were called technology leads, data managers, analysts, uh, whatever the name might be. But they were working more with the technology and analytics in the process. Uh, overwhelmingly, we talked to people who were communications or content professionals. So people working in marketing, editorial, communications manager, people who say that they are producing, strategizing, working with content on a daily basis. And we also talked to a number of people who considered themselves other, but still worked with content in some type of way. Uh, these were founders, um, people who were graphic designers, C-suite executives, managers, people that might not ne be necessarily working directly with the content, but still in relation to many communications and content professionals. So this just gives you a bit of an idea of the scope of the work we're doing. Um, I think it's a good little caveat to start with that like our work is not going to be completely representative of the entire mission driven sector of the entire nonprofit space. Um, but we really wanted to have these interviews to talk with actual professionals, um, rather than a survey, uh, we actually sat down and talked to them and got the language that they were using in relation to content content impact in data. So with all that uh, set up, um, I'm actually going to break down a little bit about what we actually found in our content impact study. So with the next slide, we're actually going to give you another poll question because we want to know what you're doing uh, before we give you the findings. So we have a quick, quick poll that Mickey's going to put on the screen. So what type of content do you, if applicable, uh, or your organization produce the most frequently. And this will inform our next slide. Give it a few more seconds. All right, I think the poll has ended. Um, but what I'm seeing is overwhelmingly, most people here are working with all of the above in pretty equal uh, levels of frequency, um, which makes sense once we go to the next slide. Um, but also I'm seeing lots of newsletters and emails, social media content. This is definitely something we saw in our study as well as um, content pieces that were pretty frequently activated uh, and used uh, in communications work. So we'll go right to the next slide. I keep alluding to it, but we're actually gonna get to it. So going into our findings, our first question to everyone that we interviewed was really, how do you define content? What is the content that you make? Just really broadly ask them kind of how we ask you in that poll, what are you working on? Um, and really the finding there wasn't that surprising, um, but most people define content in a really sort of broad sense because they are working on a lot of different things. Um, content itself as a word is a really broad term, um, but we're seeing that people are defining them as pieces of communication output, stories, messages, whatever that might be, um, newsletters, social media posts, blog posts. However, from that really sort of broad answer, because we were able to access uh, our interviewees through conversations rather than just a survey, we began to start to map out all the different ways content was being used and being discussed uh, to create a little table that we have on the right, right here. 
Um, this is, again, not, uh, these are not hard categories to define all these specific uh, posts, but this is sort of an example of how we started uh, sort of mapping out these conversations. Um, but we found that most outputs fit into a number of categories, and these categories tended to overlap in different ways. Um, and how we described it was content to unify. Uh, so we described that as content that strengthens an organization's brand, messaging, or, or image. This is sort of the content that really is at the crux of your mission. So if you're working to promote sustainability, this is the content coming out that is showing why sustainability is important to you, your community. This is the stuff that's unifying your organization, unifying the community that you're building around your organization. We also found that content to translate was often uh, discussed. So content working as translators, translating information and messages that you might have within your organization that might have within sort of the research realm, um, things that are a bit more technical, but you're trying to translate that to non-expert audiences. And then we also found the two categories of expert and public content. And this is what we're going to spend a bit more time talking about today. Um, so expert content really is that highly technical content, uh, content that is technical and made for a technical audience where it matches up. The technicality of the content matches the technicality of the folks reading it. And then public content, um, where we're getting something slightly different, where the technicality of the content is translated and it's more for a non-expert audience. So again, with that sustainability example, you might be doing really cool research. You have professionals in your field writing amazing uh, research pieces, blog posts, but sometimes you do need to translate that content for people who are not experts, um, whether to get them to unify, so get them more excited about the piece or to translate it so that they can talk about the ideas themselves. That is where public content comes in. So this is an example. These are definitely not ha hard categories um, to define these content pieces that I've listed here. Um, probably most of you working with social media are like, well, social media can be used in like more than one of these ways. Um, but this is sort of an example of how we started mapping out these conversations and mapping out where content pieces um, could actually provide value. So in our next slide, we'll go into a bit more about expert and public content. Do not be alarmed um, by this large table. Um, this really is an example of a bit more depth that we put into defining, into our defining and categorizing process. So uh, in the report that we eventually made around the content impact study, we have a number of these tables that really map out um, our notes map out all the different uh, information we learned. Um, but we're going to walk you through just one of our tables today around expert and public content. Um, so we see we have expert and public content here, but really it breaks down to these four other categories that sort of define what makes content expert, what makes content more public. Um, and really at the start of that is the goal of the content. So why are you creating the piece of content? Um, and then it breaks down into other more sort of specific details. So the audience um, of that content, the different digital content types that tend to work best uh, for that type of content, and also the teams that may be responsible for working on it. So we're gonna go into a bit more about expert content in the next slide, also a bit more about public content. So we'll just take a moment and walk through this for expert content, the definition is on the slide again, but we're really making technical content for a technical audience uh, in this example. So that means that there's generally a barrier of entry to this type of work that's a little higher than public content. Um, we can use things like jargon, industry specific, uh, even names, case studies, that if you were sharing with a public audience, would lose them at some point um, because they don't necessarily have that expertise. But in creating expert content, this is the type of thing that you want to invoke, that you want to share, because it actually increases your credibility. This is the set type of stuff that if you're a technical expert, you want to have a technical piece um, to actually learn from. So these content types usually can come a bit few and far between in an organization. 
uh, comms department. So I know most of you here are coming in um, with comms expertise. Uh, however, we talked to a lot of people that were working in other teams responsible. Um, so teams that describe themselves as research, policy, program, fellows, fellowships. Um, and the interesting part is that they refer to the work that they're doing as content being created. So while maybe someone, a comms professional would say that the content that they're producing is more social media focus, that is more one way or another, um, these teams still refer to their work as content. So I think that was a pretty interesting finding in our work to sort of expand how we describe content um, from the original definition we saw it was communication outputs, um, but we can break it down to these different types of uh, pieces and then categorize them in these ways. So we're going to talk a bit more about the applications and content data a bit later, but this is just sort of a preface a little bit more, as the slide says, um, to show that there's a lot of variety in what we consider content. Um, and there's a lot of different ways we can use data to sort of strategize and standardize other ways that we're collecting information from these outputs. So that was just a little bit. Um, and we'll have also a little bit more about public content. Um, this is a bit more of the stuff you think when uh, the generic idea of comms team comes to mind. Um, but there's so much more to public content um, from these conversations that we had. Um, three main goals that we captured from the mission driven space from these interviews um, was really using communications outputs using digital content types that we have listed there to one inform uh, a non expert audience so these are people that might not 100% know what you do what your mission is, but inform them what's going on. Um, two, to strengthen the audience support or interest in the topic so once they do know what's going on. Uh, strengthen that. And the third point is to call on actions towards the topic. So actually affect behaviors, affect action one way or another. Um, you might think this is pretty straightforward of what you would want to do uh, with your communications work, but this kind of breaks it down a bit more, specifically using language from the people uh, that we interviewed. So content is really nifty. Um, it sheds a lot of light on the specific work that we're doing. Um, and Mickey, if you can go back to the previous slide for just a little bit longer. Um, I think the last point of the slide is that uh, targeting is really important. I think most people here working comms can agree that a general audience really doesn't exist um, in this line of work. Um, because if you're trying to appeal to everyone, you don't appeal to anyone really. Um, so you're really trying to target your work to hit these different goals. Um, you're targeting so that you're translating your, well, very obviously you're trying to translate a technical topic to a non-expert audience. That's already one type of targeting, but to target people to affect their attitudes and behaviors, you need to be um, pretty proactive in how you're developing that content. So targeting an audience is sort of the key there. Um, so that's a bit more about public content. We can move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna move on just a little bit from expert and public content, um, but another point from our findings was measuring um, content impact and thinking about how, how metrics can support or hinder content development in the mission-driven space. Um, this was sort of the, I mean, it's in the name of the study, honestly, the content impact study. We wanna know how content is impacting uh, the work that we're doing impacting the missions that we're fighting for um, and honestly as data people um, here at PTKO we might be a little biased uh, but we think having a uh, really clear metrics really strategizing well can standardize your creative outputs so that you can at least collect and track the work that you're doing um, and with that sort of the opportunities are endless on how you want to activate it um, but a bit more here, uh, we go, really go into the measuring and refining steps a bit more into our report. Um, in our interviews, we actually talked to uh, professionals about how what data they collected, what they considered data, and also how data moved within their organizations. 
Um, and we break that down sort of in the same way that we broke down expert and public content into those uh, sort of larger tables. Um, but generally we found that uh, the questions that you really need to be asking when you're collecting data, data is what are we measuring for, thinking about who the teams are responsible for the metrics, the types and forms of metric outputs, uh, thinking about what we want from those metrics once we have them, and then the audience for those content metrics within your organization. So now that we have it all, now we know what we want to do with it, where is it going back out to? And then the goals of those metrics once they're actually given uh, back out to the to the different content teams. And we're going to be talking a bit more about applications in just a moment. I'll pass it back to Mickey to lead us through some actual actionable steps uh, from this work. Um, but I think in these two sort of findings that we're sharing today, a major theme in our study is talking a bit more about the relationship between content and data, thinking about content in terms of the different teams that work on it um, and knowing that it's not impossible to navigate as much content there is out there in your organization, in your community, in sort of the entire sector. Um, what it comes down to is breaking down and tracking um, and then targeting that work. And just to wrap up uh, my section, a final question we ask in every interview um, is ask our interviewees what they would most like to do with data and how data could support content in the ideal world. And we got a lot of different answers, um, but at the crux of it, um, people really wanted a deeper understanding that would allow for more transparency across the sector, more predictability across teams, um, and a wider def definition of what we consider content, a wider definition of what we consider content metrics. Um, so, I will pass along the question to you all as well. Uh, pretend that this is a mini interview that we're doing. So I think the question's on the screen already, if you can answer that real quickly. How would you want data to inform and improve your content? And if you've never thought about it or you don't really think data would be uh, helpful in informing the work you're doing, feel free to click other. Um, and you can also explain in chat as well. All right, I think the poll just ended and we see that most people we want to see how data can affect how we measure engagement. Um, you're in luck uh, because I'm going to pass it to Mickey who's actually going to share a bit about how we can use data in these different five stages uh, that we outlined at the start. So from strategizing, creating, uh, publishing and promoting, um, measuring and refining. So I think measuring will definitely be touched. Um, but thank you all for sharing a bit with us today um, and for letting me share a bit about our study. Um, the report is available. Uh, I think I saw something really quick in the chat about that. The full report is available for download and you can check out the tables in more detail afterwards as well. So thanks. Thanks so much, Chelsea. Yes, we'll be sending out the link to download the report along with the deck and the recording uh, to all registrants. And so, so you'll get that. Um, but now that Chelsea has given us the overview of how we conducted the study and our biggest takeaways, I really wanted to dive in deeper about what this means for you, your role in your organization. Um, so all of these concepts are really great, but our, one of our main goals with the content impact report was to make this information helpful and help organizations understand how to apply these theories. All right, so as Chelsea went over, we have five steps to the campaign planning process. And of the five steps, the last two have the majority of the data that you need to incorporate into your next campaign strategy. So those are steps four and five, measure and refine, which go into improving your next campaign. And from our interviews, people were very interested in how each of these steps and stages kind of affected each other and how they would build off of each other. So although we've shown this as a linear process, it's really important to remember that this actually is cyclical. Um, this is an ongoing process that would ideally never end. And each step informs the next, as well as strengthens the understanding of the people who work in all of these stages or just one or two of these stages. 
and so while we're on this, I also wanted to highlight the importance of cross-departmental collaboration. So none of these steps should happen in a vacuum, and they rarely do. Um, in fact, many of the individuals that we conducted interviews with expressed the desire to want to know more about what their peers were doing in different stages and then how they can work together. So even for smaller organizations, this may not be applicable, um, but even if there's just more than one person or department working on one of these steps or one of these campaigns, it's really important to be able to collaborate to share your findings, metrics, and strategies. Um, so of these five steps, we're going to talk about practical ways to get started on three of them, which are steps one, strategize, step four, measure, and step five, refine. So first step, we have strategize. We describe the step as using data to meet your campaign's audience where they are and match their interest to your specific content. So when planning for and conducting this step, we have a few suggestions of top priority items to keep in mind as you start going about this work. So first off, you want to start by thinking about who these different audiences and users are. Uh, previously, Chelsea talked about kind of the expert content and public content and the different audiences for that. And so that's a great thing to keep in mind because this can the audiences can vary from different types of pieces if you're an organization that produces both public and expert content. Um, but there also can be different stages in the campaign for specific audience members. And so being able to have a clear idea of who these people are, what content you want to direct them towards, and what you want that final outcome to be, or CTA, call to action. Um, this is a great place to start. And so we have an image on the right, uh, which is an example of how you may want to map it out. Our team, I'll dive into this a little bit more in the future slides, um, but our team is a big fan of Miro, that's M-I-R-O, um, and it's basically like a big digital collaborative whiteboard. And so you're able to like use stickies and drag them around. And so it's a great way to map out your audience journeys and to match them to specific uh, pieces of content that you may be producing. Right. And then now that you've decided out who you're targeting, so you've identified your audience part of your strategy, you want to think about how exactly you're going to measure that. So, for example, if you work at a think tank and you're releasing a new policy memo or recommendation, most likely your goal would be to influence the outcome of that policy. And so this, but this can happen in a lot of different ways, and all of those different outcomes can be measured differently. So you want to be able to be really specific about what your specific, what your outcome is that you're trying to measure. So, for example, maybe you want to get as many eyes on your policy memo as possible. And so an example metric of that is page views or web traffic. So you can really get the finite number of people who have clicked on it or read the memo. But maybe your goal could also be to have the right people look at it. So you don't care about how many people as long as the, uh, the lobbyists and the right politicians are reading and looking at your memo. So in that case, then you may want to be tracking different metrics, such as time spent on page. And we'll talk about some tools that can help you do that. Um, but as you can see, those are two very vastly different metrics that require different setup and strategy. And so identifying and choosing these goals are really important in the first strategy phase when you're get, getting started. And just as I talked about before about cross-departmental collaboration, once you have these goals and metrics, it's really important to align your whole team around them. And by team, this may, again, may not be people directly in your department um, or your direct reports or managers, but anyone who kind of has skin in the game for this campaign. So this can be stakeholders, executives, board, uh, maybe grant givers. And so aligning everyone around what these goals are and what you want to accomplish can be really helpful and also will come back in the future steps that we'll discuss. So once you have this guiding start, you can transition into the next three steps, which are your actual content creation and other campaign creations and have a more kind of intentional outcome in your head, which can increase your chances of reaching that goal since you have a specific one. All right, so here are a collection of tools that all have free tiers of pricing um, and can help with all of the strategizing steps that I went over. Uh, so first off, for mapping out a user's journey, I talked about Mural already, which can be really effective. Um, they have a free tier of pricing, but for some teams, maybe they just like to use Google Docs, um, something simple that everyone can just collaborate on, and that's totally fine too. Um, next, we have Google Search Console, which can help you understand how your current audiences are finding your content. And so let's say, let's go back to that example of the policy memo. So you can see what terms people are typing in on Google to find that policy memo. 
And that can inform a lot of different things that can inform like your audience, uh, the type of content that you're producing. And so that can be a really valuable uh, set of data that also is free. Um, and then also we have Microsoft Clarity. And so Microsoft Clarity um, is also free to use and you can incorporate it into your website and it'll give you really specific metrics. So the time spent on page metric that I talked about earlier, um, Microsoft Clarity can give you that. And also maybe number of clicks per page or how many clicks per minute. Um, so a lot more specific data insights if you want to drill down a little bit deeper. But for high level stuff, Google Search Console and Google Analytics, uh, which is helpful to look at your website performance overall. It's great. Um, and then also if you have content that may not be on your main website, uh, these tools can still work. And so even if it's on your main website or kind of on like a sub portal, you can still really be able to drill down into uh, this data. Great. And then lastly, we have Hive, which is a free project management tool. I know there's a bunch out there. Um, with my work at Parsons TK, I also work as a project manager. And so I know there's an overwhelming amount of project management tools, um, but Hive is a great one and can just be a central place uh, to communicate with your team, list out those goals, audiences, strategies for the campaign, and just have visibility for everyone so that everyone's on the same page. All right. So next up, we have the measure phase, which is pretty self-explanatory, but we like to think of it as the step where you really hone in on your metrics and are creating new content or material around those metrics. Um, so these first involve an action and then a way to measure that action. So in the strategize step, we were brainstorming about it, but in this step, this is when you're actually conducting the analysis and doing the measuring, plugging those tools in and reading the results. And so one of the most common and easiest response metrics is the call to action, the CTA. And so on the right in the orange box with the green button, you can see that we have a screenshot of a CTA on our homepage. Um, so this is one of the free toolkits that we uh, produce at Parsons TKO that's designed to help organizations prepare for when Google Analytics 3 ends next year, July 1st, 2023. Um, and so our call to action button on this is clicking the get started button. So the arrow is pointing to the little green box. That's where you want to direct people when they come to our home page. When they click on the green box, they're taken to that screenshot below, uh, which is a landing page with a form to access the toolkit. So we can measure both how many people are clicking on the call to action box in the first screenshot. And then also we can compare that against how many people are actually submitting the form. And so that can tell us two different things. So if they click on the first link, then that means that orange box got them. Something about it was interesting and they wanted to click. But maybe when they got to the landing page, they didn't fill out the form in the green box. Maybe the, the copy on here wasn't clear or not enticing enough. Um, but all of that data can really give our marketing team insights into how to um, change this to make it more appealing to our audience, which is mission-driven organizations. All right, and next we have impact measurement from the poll. I know a lot of you uh, express interest in this, and this also goes back to kind of understanding the purpose of your content and measuring that, which can be difficult because impact and purpose can be such vague metrics, um, but there definitely is a way to kind of go about it strategically. And sometimes this can be hard numbers, but it doesn't always have to be a data point that can be compared to something else. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a number at all. Um, and maybe for your organization or for your specific content or campaign, qualitative data is more important, more helpful for your team and your stakeholders. And so maybe this is reaching like one specific political influencer. Maybe you really want President Biden to read your policy memo. And if you accomplish that, then you feel like you've accomplished all the goals of your campaign. And, and that's great and something else to keep in mind. And using qualitative data is relevant and helpful, but just the one thing to remember um, is to define it. And so when you're reporting out or you're talking about it, instead of kind of having this abstract thing where like, we want people to listen, uh, you need to get just a little more specific, like I, the, with the example I mentioned with like having X person read the policy memo or perform X action. Um, and so data doesn't have to be, for this process, you don't have to have hard numbers. If that's not your thing or relevant, um, there's many other ways to measure it as well. All right, so I know that was kind of a heavy step. So I wanted to go in a little bit more detail um, about how to conduct these 
this data analysis, how to get these metrics, um, and then also how to share them. And so the easiest way to do this is to have a dashboard. Uh, Google Analytics is a great way to start with a dashboard. And I also personally love dashboards because it's a really easy way to share it with team members and also to help guide conversations, whether you're in a meeting or planning for another campaign. Um, and you can refer back to this dashboard at any point in the five-step campaign uh, content lifecycle. And so you can use Google Data Studio, as I mentioned, and if your organization is set up to use Google Analytics, um, then you also can automatically have those pull into your dashboard. But also, so we have a screenshot of our dashboard on the right, one of the other free resources on our website. And if this looks too complicated for you, that's totally fine. You also can just make like a simple graph or on a spreadsheet and Google Sheets or Excel, whatever works uh, for your team. And then once you have the data and you're able to collect it and put it into some type of condensed place, um, the next really important step is to sit down as a team and review it together. You want to really be able to dedicate a conversation to look at all this data and understand it. And so you can look at what your best and worst metrics were um, and what you want to change or what worked really well and you want to carry out and incorporate into all of your campaigns in the future. And then that actually takes us to step five of the content life cycle, which is refine. Right, so refining is just reporting on the contact in, content impact of your campaign to affect internal strategies and behaviors. So like I mentioned, comparing and contrasting what worked and what didn't. And you can think of this kind of as like a retrospective or a debrief that's cross-departmental as applicable uh, to review what you thought the campaign would accomplish and then contrast it to what it actually accomplished and how it maybe matched your initial hypotheses um, about who you thought, what you thought the user camp audience, sorry, the user uh, journey would be in the strategized phase and see if that actually happened. And the metrics in the dashboard can be a way to compare that. Um, and so also with this phase and refining, maybe you find out that you wanna standardize the reporting process. Maybe you wanna have everyone use Excel charts or maybe you wanna have everyone use Google Studio dashboards. And that can also be a great way as you repeat this cyclical process to compare and contrast uh, the metrics from all of your previous campaigns. Right, and then um, like I mentioned, conducting in weekly team meetings, it can be an option. I think the biggest takeaway from this is just to dedicate time to analytics into the refining part. And so if you have like a strategy plan, uh, that's a strategy meeting at the beginning of every campaign, you also need to schedule time with your team to sit down and review all of this before you start the next campaign. Or if you have multiple campaigns at the same time, whenever the first campaign ends. And that I think really is the key to all of this that we learned from our interviews um, from talking to everyone, analyzing our interview results and putting all of this together is that if you're able to dedicate time to it, which I know can be difficult, that's the best way to get started on this. Uh, some of these steps can seem really confusing and complicated, uh, but if you just use that as kind of your starting point, then you'll be surprised by um, how much you can incorporate data into the rest of your content lifecycle. All right, so for our call to action, uh, I wanted to share with you all about our outreach technology road mapping workshop. And so it can definitely be difficult to work through some of these more specific steps of the content lifecycle and how data can be used in each of them and how it can be woven throughout. And so if you don't have a clear view of the bigger picture, our workshop is a great way um, to kind of work with us to understand what that can be. It will help you to prioritize your audiences and channels and segment that into different strategies for content distribution. And so I will drop this link into the chat um, along with that link I mentioned before about the Google Analytics Toolkit. And we'll also be sending this out in our follow-up materials to everyone. All right, so that is all we have for you today in terms of the content impact study. But as I mentioned, we'll be sending out lots of resources and we also have a lot of other free resources on our website. Um, so we have our blogs, articles, uh, podcasts, informational videos. And so please feel free to check that out and then also reach out to us with any questions that you have. Um, but I know that we have a few minutes left and so would love to take 
any questions that the audience has. 